Tonight, the impact of what's been called the shadow pandemic, the devastating blow COVID is having on our mental health. All the restrictions and the lockdowns are taking a toll. And while it is confronting, it is critical that the true cost on individuals, on families, on all of us is taken seriously. Patrick McGorry is a pioneer in mental health care. I spoke to him and epidemiologist Tony Blakely a short time ago. Well, Patrick McGorry and Tony Blakely, thank you so much for joining us. We are all worn down by this pandemic, wondering when there'll be light at the end of this tunnel. Professor McGorry, how badly is it impacting mental health in Australia? What are you seeing? What are you hearing on the front line of this? Uh, well, we're definitely seeing a surge. We did modelling last year and uh, predicted a 30% increase um, in need for care, and, and especially in young people. And that's definitely what we're seeing in, in the only data source we can really reliably depend on, and that's emergency department presentations, which have surged in this age group, teenagers and young adults in particular. So yes, it's not unexpected. Um, and I think beyond that, the, the whole population, as you've just alluded to, is, is their morale has suffered a lot. They may not need need mental health care per se, but they uh, there's been a loss of morale. And, and that means that the people trying to support those vulnerable to mental illness are also um, really pretty uh, exhausted and that's having uh, flow on effects. Teachers, uh, health workers, parents, all of those people who are the support systems are really starting to, to go under. And we're seeing that play out too in Lifeline and the Children's Helpline. They've never seen anything like it. People reaching out for help in record numbers. Yeah, and the problem is there's nothing much beyond, beyond those helplines. The, 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 the system of care is full. And, and that's why it's spilling over into, into emergency departments. So, so we've got a capacity problem here. And, and we know that anyway, even before the pandemic, the mental health system was really, as our Premier described it, bro it was broken and we had a Royal Commission. So it was incredibly ill-prepared, much worse than any other part of the health system to respond to these sort of crises and, and, uh, and, and uh, surges of need. And Professor Blakely, the restrictions, the lockdowns, the work that they're doing to contain COVID, are they doing more damage than the virus itself? Or are we just creating an even greater health crisis here? Um, they're necessary, unfortunately, but we need to innovate. But first of all, those lockdowns, they're gonna be needed no matter what country you're in to keep the level of the virus at whatever you set, be it a low, medium or high level or trying to go for elimination. But assuming that the mental health effects are largely from the lockdown, not from the fact that there's a pandemic per se, due to the lockdown, I think we can do better. We need to innovate. We're going to need better strategies going into next year, other than just using a lockdown to try and control this virus. So what are they? Much improved ventilation in schools and public workplaces will mean we need to spend less time in lockdown, vaccine coverage is up here, and then we've got other measures in place that mean that we don't have to use lockdown as much. Mass masking probably most of the time. So even when the virus doesn't appear to be around much, it actually dampens the transmission. Mass testing, mass rapid antigen testing. We need to start thinking about rolling out these tests that you do yourself or supervised in 15 minutes. So for example, they could be used as a strategy to help kids get back to school, test them all on a Monday and a Thursday, say, for essential workers. We need to think about these things that will help reduce the transmission and at least control it to whatever level we set to protect our health services without using lockdown as the only adjunct to vaccination. And in the short to medium term, we know that the numbers of people getting vaccinated are rising, which is what we want to see, but so too are the number of infections. Is it going to get worse, this pandemic, before it does get better? Well, stuff I've been looking at, so I've got a little wee Excel model that I update each day based on numbers in Victoria and New South Wales. And for Victoria, where we're heading now, we're probably heading towards a peak of 2,000 cases before we can turn it around. And that would be a peak in about November, staying in the conditions we are now. Mm. So again, it emphasises the need for that innovation to not only mean the peak is not as high as 2,000, but to find strategies other than lockdown. But the cruel, hard reality here is this virus is quite something, and we've got quite a long way to go. We've got at least 18 months to get our way through this to either a solution, an exit, which involves better vaccines, maybe, or 
where we live with the virus without using lockdowns, which is where the innovation needs to come into play. But right at the moment, we do rely heavily on lockdowns. They do work on the virus point of view, but with a heavy mental health toll. We did see a major shift this week from the Victorian Premier, from Daniel Andrews, abandoning this hope of getting the Delta genie back into the bottle, shifting the Mm. focus to vaccinations, not to zero cases. Professor McGorry, do you see that as a turning point here? I I certainly did um, at the time see see it that way because at least then we we have a way out of it rather than this kind of... um, uh, I don't know, a very unrealistic COVID zero idea, uh, which the rest of the world really has shown that can't be achieved. And now we're learning that too. So I, I did feel it was positive. Listening to Tony, then I'm feeling a little bit more pessimistic, I've got to say. Um, I, I do accept, you know, that the expertise in that space is, 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 the, is the key thing. But, but I don't think it's true to say lockdowns are the only cause of of, of the spike or the surge in mental ill health. It's happened in other parts of the country. Not, not, there isn't a dose-response relationship to, to lockdown. Lockdowns definitely make it worse, but, but um, there's, a, there's a much wider and deeper effect of, of the pandemic, and there are economic cons- uh, impacts of it too in terms of risks of suicide. The economic drivers are probably the, 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 uh, another serious concern. And so, so, so I think that the modelling that we've done anyway from a mental health point of view shows that it's going to be a very long and deep surge uh, in terms of mental health care. And just when the lockdowns stop, it's not going to be, the tap's not going to be turned off by any means. So reform, investment and growth of the mental health system to make it much more responsive and much more effective um, is going to be needed. And do you think that it was a good idea, Tony, to abandon that idea of zero cases? Um, I guess, well, yeah, we, we had to. We were forced to. But the elimination strategy that we've used successfully in Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, for a time in Singapore, it was the idea was to keep it out so you could live normally. And then we were always going to pivot back to having it back in when we got to 80% vaccination. But both New South Wales and Victoria have been forced to pivot early. Um, It would be my strong advice to the premiers outside of these two states and also ACT to try and keep the virus out as long as they can while the vaccination coverage gets up so they don't need to use such harsh lockdown measures. Um, So, yeah, we had to pivot away from the elimination strategy because the the virus beat us. But for places like New Zealand that's heading back towards elimination, it looks like they're going to win. And for the other states, keep it out as long as you can until your vaccination coverage is high and then open up. Does it create a, a sense, though, for states like Victoria in particular, which has been through the toughest restrictions in the country, and this is the sixth time round, are people left wondering, Patrick, why will we put through this then if we're now abandoning zero cases? Yeah, no, I don't think so. I think Tony's logic is pretty impeccable there. I think it was definitely the right thing to try for to buy time while the vaccination rates came up. The problem is we've been so slow at doing that. But now we're, we, we, we're, getting, we're getting there. So what I don't quite understand is why it's so pessimistic once we get to 80 90 percent which we probably will get to do in the next few months and i, I was talking to a colleague in iceland um, um, uh, yesterday who's the, who's the chief uh, executive officer of the main hospital in reykjavik and they seem to have a, a pretty good situation there i wonder what tony thinks about that because surely it can yeah. be more optimistic than what you're saying about the, the sort of many many months so the 80%, 80% of adults only, so 16 plus year olds, does not get you to herd immunity. No way. Why? Because our vaccines are really good at stopping us get sick and die, but they're not as good at stopping transmission. So AstraZeneca lowers your risk of getting any infection by 60%, and Pfizer's better at 80%. But that still means you've got a 40% of your previous risk or 20% of getting any infection. And then your chance of passing it on We did know that for the pre-Delta variants, if you were unlucky enough to be infected and you were vaccinated, you were half as likely to transfer it on. So that was quite good. But we're seeing with Delta, most unfortunately, that the people who get infected, who are vaccinated, have as high virus levels as those who are infected and unvaccinated. So we have a problem with Delta and trying to get to herd immunity, and it's going to probably require better vaccines or 
what we've got now with boosters and their natural infection, unfortunately, having to top it off to get to some sort of exit. So it's still very challenging. 80% of children and adults, that's a lot better, though. We'll mm. be in lockdown a lot less time. But and, that, so there's the positive. And, and with the, the shift, matter. too, with, with children, because we have seen, the, obviously, the 12 to 15-year-olds, that will start happening mm. from September 13th. And we've also had the TGA today approve Moderna for vaccinating 12 to 17-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Tony, will that be a big help in getting those vaccination yeah. rates up? Yeah, and I'm, I'm strongly of the view that we will see the vaccines um, made available to five plus year olds at some point. And my real hope here is that between now and Christmas, we can at least offer vaccines to all school age children before the Christmas break and get us up to 80% of five plus year olds throughout Australia and maybe have a nice Christmas and New Year before we open the borders up and it gets bumpy again. So that's what I'm still hoping for. Well, hope is something that has been in short supply. So we need to hang on to as much of that as we possibly can. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Pleasure. I hope that was useful. And a reminder that Lifeline offers 24 hour crisis support. There is also a kids helpline for young people. All the details are on your screen.